Spring Creek Project for Ideas, Nature, and the Word. The uh, sponsor of today's event, along with the uh, College of uh, History, Philosophy, and Religion, and the Department of Forest Ecosystems and Society. Thanks to them. Thanks to uh, to Bob Pecano, our communication specialist, who did our uh, our flyer and is here to videotape today. Um, I want to make a brief announcement. Uh, on the table outside, there's a sign-up sheet for Spring Creek's email list. If you like what we do, we'd love to add you to that. Um, we're also, we've just launched a great, uh, exciting event, uh, a series of uh, events called the Campus Creature Census. Each of you in the room and everybody you know is invited to um, help us create a, uh, in, uh, a inventory of all the plants, animals, fungi, uh, microbes, rocks, whatever, on the OSU campus to help us re-inhabit our place and recognize the other creatures we share campus with. Um, so uh, a profile in prose or poetry, uh, artwork, photography, um, pretty much anything uh, that you think would be a, a nice addition to that. There's some little quarter sheet flyers <coughs> out on that table, and you can pick one of those up with uh, more guidelines about how to participate in the campus creature. Quick question, please. Yeah, please. Any criteria or a certain number of pages or anything for that? Thing? Yes, very strict. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, yes. Short, short. There they are. You mean I can't get it online? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent, thank you for helping you out with that. Yeah. So, um, uh, Virginia Morrill gave a great talk. Uh, last night from her new book, Animal Wise, at, at LaSalle's. We have about 450 people at the Women of the Video Auditorium. Uh, and very, very, very engaging. She concluded her reading uh, last night with a couple of uh, paragraphs from the epilogue of Animal Wise. Um, and I think she's going to share that with us. Basically, it says that she's outlined some of the research that points to greater cognition and greater emotional range in a host of animals, from chimpanzees and whales down to uh, rats and ants, uh, archer fish, and, uh, and other creatures. So and her last chapter says, so what are the implications of that? What uh, does it suggest about human relationships with other creatures? And that's what we wanted to take up today. We wanted to pick up where, where Virginia left off in her book and, and uh, talk about um, what it means to us that this research is so uh, profoundly, overwhelmingly in evidence of a greater cognition and greater emotional range in all kinds of animals. In order to make uh, reasoned choices about our courses of action in relationship to other animals, it's not enough to know just the facts. We need also need to know what our values are regarding the situation under question. So we need scientists, but we also need ethicists to help us clarify our, uh, our uh, moral ground in these issues, and we need storytellers. We need poets and essayists and novelists and visual artists and journalists to help us try out possible narratives that we can weave together and to uh, explain the realities of the world and the aspirations of human values into compelling stories about how we want to live. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the task today, and that's the mix of uh, speakers that we have planned. Um, scientists, scientists, uh, journalists, uh, ethicists, creative writers, and, uh, and uh, we'll be coming at this from all kinds of ways of knowing. So here's the plan. I am going to introduce all the speakers up front in the order they'll speak, which is uh, on the slide. And they are going to each uh, present a, a, a quick snapshot uh, of the animal phenomena that they are especially familiar with. And by the time we've heard from a couple of scientists, a creative writer, a philosopher, a science journalist, and environmental ethicist, I suspect that you're going to be sitting on your hands, <laughs> twitching with eagerness to ask a question and, and uh, make your comments about this uh, compelling issue. So that's what we're going to do for the second hour of the day. Uh, you can uh, free your hands and uh, raise them up and, and add your voice to this conversation. So here we go. Here I'm going to uh, do quick invitations, and we're off and running. Uh, Michael Nelson is our moderator. 
He is a professor of environmental ethics and philosophy. And Michael also serves as the lead principal investigator for the H.J. Andrews Long-Term Ecological Research Program. He's also a philosopher in residence for the Isle Royale Wolf Moose Project, the longest continuous study of predator prey systems in the world. So he's had a lot of experience working with scientists, and he's a senior fellow for the Spring Creek Project. Thanks, everyone. So lovely. If you don't have better things to do, but, uh, <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll take it. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be the moderator, uh, but I'm going to I want to set the table with a couple of um, uh, ideas about the relationship between <clears throat> science and values, and science and ethics. So the epilogue of Virginia's book uh, focuses on this question, as, as Charles mentioned. But one of the things, if you were there last night, that you noticed that. Uh, Virginia sort of described all this work of all these people, and all anybody wanted to talk about was ethics and the questions. And all the questions were about, so what? What, what do we do? Uh, which was is really interesting. Um, two main topics, or two sort of things that we can think about in, in this way, two philosophical topics, um, and, and some of them are very much what, what is being done in this in this book and by our by our colleagues here. We have. The question about what you know, what do we know, um, and then how do we go about knowing it? So, what do we know about the minds of animals, and how do we go about knowing those kinds of things? And then the question is, well, you know, what should we do as a result of that? We so desperately want to put these things together: what we know about the world and how we act in the world. And what we often do is we do it like this. Um, and, and I'll just think of this case in particular: um, we find out, or we come to believe that. Animals possess something, insert your quality here. Um, they can use language, they can reason, they're sentient, something like that. Um, and then what we often do is we jump to, and we, were, we saw this last night, we jump to, therefore we ought to do all of these things, insert your practice here. We desire this for sort of consistency. The problem is, is uh, this might not be the best way to think about this. It's not consistent, it's not complete. If we want to arrive at a conclusion that suggests that we ought to do something, the facts of the matter, no matter how well we arrive at them, aren't enough to allow us to get there. We really should be thinking about it like this. P's are premises or evidence to support a conclusion. Um, we have to have the kinds of premises that the scientists that Virginia is writing about um, are, are delivering to us. Animals possess certain qualities, whatever those qualities might be. But we also have to affirm that those qualities are relevant, that they count. Um, that we have to say things like sentience matters, rationality is morally <laughs> relevant, eye color is not. We have to have those kinds of, of affirmations. And it's only through the, the combination of the descriptive premises, the scientific premises, and the value premises that we can arrive at a conclusion that suggests that we ought to act accordingly. Now, there are blanks here, and there's all kinds of work to be done. This is just the most basic of frameworks. So just, I mean, out of the blue, um, you know, one of the things that we might ask ourselves about premise one is, well, how do we know those things? This is an epistemological premise. Why should I believe these scientists? Um, how do they arrive at the knowledge claims that they make? P2 is something that we often infer um, from other things that we think about humans. If we think sentience is morally relevant in humans, what's important is sentience, not whether or not it adheres to humans or not. So what we often do there is we try to infer moral inclusiveness on the basis of something that we're already committed to in the human realm. In other words, we're just appealing to consistency. We're saying just act consistently. Act on those things that you already pretend that you believe. Um, and then finally, even if we arrive at a conclusion that suggests that we ought to act accordingly, we still have questions like, well, what does this actually mean about what we what we do in the world, what actual actions um, are implied by a, a moral obligation, and what are the obstacles. The important thing here is to realize that even if I can't figure out the actual actions, and even if there are really overwhelming obstacles, that by itself does not mean that the argument isn't good. Uh, the argument can stand quite apart from those things. We sometimes push those things together, unfortunately. So let's just take a couple of these quickly. The inference question. Um, how do we go about knowing things? Well, I think, and I, I, a long, long time ago, I did my master's work on 
animal welfare ethics. It was really bad work, but I remember it. Um, the university that gave me the award, uh, the degree remembers it too. They keep writing like, nasty letters asking for that. Uh, go away, Jose. Uh, well, I think I think what we do is we, we we make an argument that goes something like this. We say, well, you know, look at what we're seeing. They look like us. You know, they have central nervous systems. They're physiologically set up in a way that we recognize as similar enough, whatever we might mean by that, to us. And then we also observe something else. We observe that they act like us, that they behave like us in some recognizably relevant way. And so we infer, we conclude by inference that, well, they must feel like us, that. Um, and one might say, well, gee, inference is an awful tough way to sort of claim what's going on in the mind of another animal. You would only think that until you started to wonder about how you do it with other humans. The only mind you have access to is your own. And so we do this in the human realm all the time. Uh, we make inferences about the condition of other people's minds. And we do it as an inference. And of course, it's easier to do it with humans. It's easier to do it with humans that speak English than it is humans that speak French, uh, because you speak their language. But that doesn't mean it can't be done elsewhere. So this is the kind of way that we're trying to fill in that, that first premise. What happens, I think, eventually, is we get enough information, and something really sort of ethically amazing happens, that the burden of proof shifts. We, I think we heard the, the word sea change like three times last night. Um, I think, well, what does that mean? This is one way to describe what a sea change is. The burden of proof shifts. Um, at one time, we didn't think very much about animal minds or animals in general. We didn't even think they had minds. And so the burden of proof was on those who wanted to protect animals. You had to sort of articulate and defend that position. But something's changed recently. In fact, something changed in the US military today. Uh, they're no longer allowed to shoot 10,000 goats to study, uh, to help uh, combat uh, medics. Um, evidently, you learn how to, what it is to treat a goat that's been shot. But uh, the inference is it's called life tissue something. So you shoot the goat, and then the medics can go to work on, on the goat. They have to come up with a plan to phase that out. That just was announced today. So there's a burden of proof shift, it seems, uh, seems going on. Now the burden of proof seems to be on those who want to do, to do that harm. That's a big deal. That's a justice system um, that's, a, that, that's you know, innocent, guilty until proven innocent from innocent until proven guilty. The other thing that I mentioned is this idea of a moral community, these arguments about what belongs and why does something belong in the moral community. What deserves direct moral standing? What counts? What matters? What no longer has to justify uh, it's, it's a consideration. And what kinds of things are left outside of the moral community? And the important thing about the work that the scientists that, that Virginia is, is reporting on are, are doing is, what they're doing is they're, they're tweaking with this notion of the key to moral consideration anymore. You have to draw that boundary for a reason, and it's preferably a good one. Eye color is not a good one. Uh, we have to offer a good one. And so they're challenging our, the notion of what has the key to moral consideration. Is it just humans, or is it other things? I think in some ways the thing that, the thing that a lot of people think is that, oh, it was just a bunch of you know, granola munching, pot smoking hippies in the 70s who started being interested in animals, um, and whether or not the animals had minds. This is actually a very old question, um, and, and people have been wrestling with this in profound ways for quite a long time. The philosopher Jeremy Bentham wrestled with the, the moral implications um, uh, of the, the question of animal minds. And he actually says, he, he's prophesizing here, he says, the day may come when the rest of the animal creation may acquire those rights which never could have been withholden from them but by the hand of tyranny. It, it may come one day to be recognized that the number of the legs, the velocity of the skin, or the termination of the all sacrum are reasons insufficient for abandoning a sensitive being what else is it that should trace the insuperable line? So what should determine that boundary of moral inclusion, in other words? Is it the faculty of reason or perhaps the faculty of discourse? The question is not, according to Bentham, can they reason or can they talk, but can they suffer? Why should the law refuse its protection to any sense of being? The time will come when humanity will extend its mantle over everything which breathes. 1781, Bentham's right. It was English. <laughs> More reluctant, maybe. I don't know. Another Englishman. I didn't really want to get on an Englishman theme here, but uh, 
Darwin uh, writes about this you know, about 90 years later. Darwin himself, in two chapters of his book, Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, writes about animal minds. He lays the most basic kind of anecdotal framework uh, for what we see the scientists who are focused on this question doing now. He goes through all of these qualities like reason and even weird ones like belief in God. Um, and he argues, and in fact he says point blank in this long chapter, chapter two in Descent, that his object is to show, so solely to show that there is no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals and their mental faculties. No fundamental difference. The difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, is certainly one of degree and not of kind. And so the argument, if I put it in diagrammatic form, um, is that prior to Darwin, um, we used to make, we used to know that humans had a range of abilities. So maybe that's a range of rational faculties or maybe language use, but that that range was distinct from the range that non-human animals had. So they too had a range, but there was a boundary between those ranges. What Darwin is doing here is he's saying that it doesn't actually work like that. The world is actually not constructed like that. That those ranges overlap with one another. And what Darwin does when he blurs this metaphysical boundary between humans and non-humans is he blurs the ethical boundary as well. The ethical boundary was determined on that little space between those upper circles, which Darwin suggests does not actually exist. And I think the work that we're seeing in Virginia's book is a continuation of, uh, of Darwin's blurred boundaries here. And so he says at the end of Descent, he says, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent man's sympathies from extending to the men of all nations and races. So this he's writing when we don't even extend moral consideration of humans um, at, at this time. If indeed such men are separated from him by great differences in appearance or habits, experience unfortunately shows us how long it is before we look at them as our fellow creatures. Sympathy beyond the confines of man, that is, the humanity, that is humanity to the lower animals, seems to be one of the latest moral acquisitions. So, I mean, Darwin's suggesting that we're, we're getting there, and he suggested this in 1871. Maybe we're just slow. Uh, so. <laughs> So that's all I want to do. I just want to sort of throw those little uh, frameworks out and, uh, and then just pray that everybody else's comments fit neatly into that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't curse this.